The practicals are really important, so this video is simply practical pointers, those little details that you might forget, and it's based on Unit 1 and Unit 2 practicals, and it's all geared towards Leaving Cert Biology revision. Section B is all to do with the practicals. It's worth 15%. So if you know the practicals, it's an easy 15%. So just think about that. So when you're revising, say to yourself, I'm definitely revising all of these experiments. And on the day, I'm going to try and do all of section B, every question. Your first practical in Leaving Cert Biology is learning how to use the microscope. You should be able to at least label the microscope and know what all of the labels do. You could be examined on them. Students often forget that the eyepiece magnifies. And remember, when you're using the high power lens, you should only need to use the fine focus knob only. The iris diaphragm, sometimes you need to use this to regulate the amount of light so that you see your specimen more clearly. You could be asked that. Remember, before you remove your slide from the stage, if you're using the high power lens, always switch to the low power lens. Why? Because you will crack and break the slide. You could be examined on that. Cover slips are always applied to your specimen or to your samples, and this is to prevent them from drying out and it also keeps them in position. When you apply the cover slip, you do so at an angle to avoid trapping air bubbles. You viewed onion cells under the microscope. You prepared the slide first and the stain you used was iodine. You did the same with cheek cells. However, when you were preparing your slide, the stain you used was methylene blue. So what is the purpose of these stains? Why use stains? Well, you can prepare your samples and use water and compare what you see. You will see more detail with a stain. The stains will enhance the contrast and they'll make cell parts easier to visualise. The food tests, a series of important practicals. You first tested for a reducing sugar. The reagent or the chemical you used was Benedict's solution, but you could use Felling's solution as an alternative. You heat the sample, but you do not boil it. And a positive result is the blue changing colour to brick red. So blue to brick red is positive for reducing sugar. The test for starch. The reagent or the chemical you used was iodine. You're also testing for a named polysaccharide when you test for starch, often examined. And the colour change is yellow-brownish to blue-black, positive for starch. So blue-black is a positive colour for starch, but know the change. The test for protein. The reagent used was Biorette solution, but you could use two individual chemicals such as copper sulfate solution and sodium hydroxide. The colour change is blue to purple, so positive is purple for protein. The test for fat. The reagents or the chemicals, well we used none, we did the brown paper test, but you could use a chemical Sudan 3 as an alternative. A positive result for the brown paper test is a permanent translucent stain. Next, we have the enzyme practicals, and you began your enzyme practical study by looking at the effect of temperature and pH on enzyme activity. For each of these experiments, the enzyme was catalase, and we sourced it in celery. The substrate was hydrogen peroxide, and this was broken down to produce oxygen and water, but oxygen is the most important product we're interested in. You measured the rate of reaction by measuring the volume of foam produced in unit time, two minutes. So when you wanted to change or to maintain a specific pH, buffer solution was used. When you wanted to change or maintain a particular temperature, water baths checked with thermometers were used or thermostatically controlled water baths. The next practical, you examined the effect of heat denaturation on enzyme activity. This is exactly the same setup used as for pH and temperature. The only difference is one sample of celery will be boiled for 10 minutes or placed in very hot water for 10 minutes. The temperature of the water baths is still 25 degrees Celsius and the buffer solution used is pH 9. The results, after two minutes, the boiled celery produced no foam. Catalase had been denatured, but in the fresh sample, foam was produced after those two minutes. Next practical is the enzyme immobilisation practical. So in this practical, the enzyme used was sucrase found in yeast. It was immobilised in gel made from sodium alginate and the beads were hardened in calcium chloride solution. So each bead has yeast which has the enzyme sucrase and the bead is made from calcium alginate. Part two of the practical is testing the application. Do the immobilised beads actually work? Do they catalyse? So you place your beads into a dropping funnel and into this you're going to place your sucrose solution. Your control was a free yeast solution in a dropping funnel and to this the sucrose solution was added. So in both dropping funnels you end up with the enzyme sucrase in the yeast. Substrate is sucrose solution and the product is is glucose and you're going to test for glucose every two minutes with a glucose test strip. 
The results, glucose was produced in both setups. It was produced more slowly with the immobilised beads, but the product was clearer. It did not contain yeast. Glucose was produced much more quickly in the free yeast. However, the product was cloudy as yeast was mixed in with the glucose. Next practical, production of alcohol by yeast. You start off with sterile glassware because you do not want any microorganisms present. You use cool boiled glucose solution, boiling it drove out the oxygen. The yeast will respire anaerobically to produce alcohol, but also carbon dioxide gas will be released too. So you had two flasks. Your test flask contained the glucose solution and the yeast. Your control also had that cool boiled glucose solution, but no yeast. You maintained anaerobic conditions by using a fermentation lock and you filled it with lime water and this prevented the entry of microorganisms. You placed both your flasks into an incubator or a thermostatically controlled water bath at 30 degrees Celsius and left it for 24 hours. You noticed immediately with your test flask that there were bubbles in the lime water and you could also see a froth eventually forming. So those bubbles were key to show you that anaerobic respiration was taking place. In the control vessel, no bubbles, nothing happening and the lime water stayed clear. Was alcohol produced after 24 hours? You performed the iodoform test to check. With your control vessel, you filtered some of the contents and placed some of the filtrate into a test tube. You did the same with your test apparatus, filtered it and placed some of the filtrate into a test tube. And to each of those test tubes, you added these chemicals, potassium iodide solution and sodium hypochlorite solution. Very important. And you warmed the test tubes in a water bath for a few minutes at 60 degrees Celsius. Both test tubes were removed from the water bath and examined and you can see in one of them, the test test tube, that there was this yellow precipitate formed. A positive result for alcohol is the formation of those yellow crystals. Next practical, to investigate the influence of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis. Water baths were set at 25 degrees Celsius for this whole experiment. The plant used was an aquatic plant. Elodea, or Canadian pondweed. Rate was measured by counting the number of oxygen bubbles released in one minute and the pondweed was placed in pond water to ensure carbon dioxide was in excess. Light intensity was altered by changing the distance of the plant to the light. It was very important that every time the plant was moved, you waited five minutes before counting because the plant had to adjust to the new light intensity. Next practical was to demonstrate osmosis and we used visking tubing to create those selectively permeable membranes. So we made two cells of visking tubing. Into one we placed sucrose solution and into the other distilled water. We determined the mass of both before placing them into beakers of distilled water and leaving them for a time. We noted that only the cell that had the sucrose solution, the more concentrated one, gained in mass and became more turgid. There was no change in the other, the control. Next practical is to isolate DNA from plant tissue and we specifically used onion. There are many steps to this practical and you have to know each of them and why you're doing them. So firstly, the onion was chopped. This was to break down the cell walls. Washing up liquid was added to the onion to break down the cell membranes and nuclear membranes. Salt was added to make the DNA clump together. The onion with the washing up liquid and the salt solution was heated in a water bath at 60 degrees Celsius to denature enzymes that would break down the DNA. It was left there for 15 minutes and then immediately put into an ice bath to prevent the breakdown of DNA. It was blended to break down cell walls and membranes further and it was filtered to remove cellular debris. Some of the filtrate was added to a test tube and a few drops of protease was added. Protease will break down the histone proteins. To this then, ice code ethanol was added. Ice code ethanol draws the water out of the DNA. This makes the DNA less dense and it moves out of that onion solution. So you can see the DNA in the picture there, so make sure that you can describe what it looks like. Note that the ethanol must be ice cold because DNA is soluble in warm ethanol. So that covers Unit 1 and Unit 2 practicals. Don't forget about ecology and please be warned that this video is practical pointers only, not the full details. Read your textbooks or watch the other videos if they help, but learn the full details. And don't forget about Unit 3 practicals. The very best of luck.